Days in the Caucasus by Banin. That's the pen name for Um El Banu Asadulayeva. She's an Azerbaijani writer of Turco-Persian origin. Uh, the book was originally published in Paris in 1945, then re-edited by the author in 1985, and it was translated from French to English by Anne Thompson Amadova and published in 2019 by Pushkin Press. Uh, how did I pick up this book? The old-fashioned way. I went to a bookstore in the city where I live, Seville, Spain, a bookstore called Chaotica. I went to the English language section, saw the cover, it's a very beautiful cover, opened it, looked at the first paragraph. The first paragraph reads like this. We all know poor families that are respectable. Mine, in contrast, was extremely rich, but not respectable at all. All right? Wow. Okay? Then the paragraph ends with, my interest as an author is at odds with my concern to preserve the last shreds of family pride. So you know you're getting a juicy story, and the book does not disappoint. Okay? Um, I think it was the critic Arlene Croce. Arlene Croce was a dance critic for The New Yorker. And uh, she wrote a book called After Images. And the idea of the title is that she judged the quality of a dance performance by the number of after images it left with her. Okay? And I think that's a completely legitimate way to, to judge the quality of a book. Okay? The number of after images it leaves with you is a sign of its quality as literature. This book has left tons of after images for me. It takes place uh, before and after and around the October Revolution, the Russian Revolution, which took place in 1914. Um, and all the changes that basically she went through and her family went through. Her great-grandfather was a peasant, and oil was found on his property, and he died a millionaire. And her father is now running, or the president of this oil company, and uh, she's one of the richest people in Baku, which is the capital of, of Azerbaijan. But primarily, okay, what makes this memoir stand out is that normally, when you read a memoir, you get a sense of maybe three two, three characters. There's probably at least a half dozen, maybe more, characters that remain alive in my memory after reading this book. All right? First of all, there's her grandmother, okay? I mean, her grandmother is this, I think she's described as a strange mix of the imperious and the vulgar. This woman is enormously fat. She's this matriarch of the family. And she kind of resides over family members and these obsequious gardeners and poor people from the commode. She sits on the commode, covers it with her skirts, and orders people around. I mean, she spits whenever a white person passes. I mean, she is really a fascinating character. There's also her sister, Layla, who she describes as mustachioed and... A breast destined to feed an entire tribe who flirts with anyone between the ages of 16 and 60. Then there's her cousin Gulnar. I mean, she describes Gulnar as Gulnar is a cousin maybe two years older than her and describes her as um, having a violent desire for men and despising them at the same time. She says, um, she calls her brazen, cynical, lighthearted, and deeply immoral. I mean, who doesn't want to read about a character like that? And you really do read about her. You read, about, you see her talking, you see her living, you see her acting and reacting. Her brothers, Assad and Ali, like they're more comfortable lying than telling the truth. So when they tell the truth, it seems like they're lying. The father of this family, not, not the author's father, but the father of this family of Gulnar and Asad and Ali, 
His name is Uncle Suleiman. This family have a, have a passion for mudslinging. That's the word, right? This guy is like, you know, he eats ice cream and puts flies in it. I mean, bizarre stuff like that. All these after images that are left with me. And then, it's like just the way she, re he's her favorite uncle, okay? But there are times in the book where he puts her on his knee and does and touches her in an inappropriate way. I mean, says things to her that are so inappropriate. I mean, from our modern day Western perspective, it's so inappropriate. That's the thing about this book, you know? Normally, when you read books by, I don't know, immigrants or first generation Americans, normally the writers themselves, okay, are writing from a kind of quite clear sort of American or Western perspective. So the prejudices of the Western world sort of seep into their work, okay? So in a way, you don't really get the chance to see, you don't really get a chance to read frank, unjudgmental descriptions and portrayals of a foreign culture. In this book, that is exactly what you get. I mean, she writes about things like polygamy, pederasty, incestual lesbian petting, let's say, marriages between 15-year-old girls and 60-year-old men, or even rape, children playing at persecution and rape, and that playing crossing over into reality. She writes about all these things, okay, without judging them, very, very frankly. So we're able to see these practices and these traditions in the most objective way possible. And if you come to the book with an open mind, I mean, it even stretches it more. I mean, there are things that you read that you can't possibly condone. And it's not as though she condones it. She really does keep no secrets. I mean, the whole idea in memoir writing of you should not write about something if you're afraid of offending the people you love. I mean, she has absolutely no fear of that. You get her revealing secret after secret, but she's not revealing these secrets gratuitously. These secrets are being revealed in the service of a tremendously profound and telling and historic story. This is not a story about submissive women in a sexually repressed epic and tradition. I mean, this is about women with character. Another thing about this book is that she is so good at describing her inner life. She's a daydreamer, right? She'll, th she'll write things like daydreaming, the daily bread of the dissatisfied. Kudos for the translator for that because that did not come out that way in French, okay? Or she'll say that she constantly sought solitude to dream in peace. And so you see her like cultivating her imaginative self. You see how she fell in love with books. She's got this aunt, I think her name is Aunt Rena, her favorite aunt. And this aunt is kind of a dilettante and she's got this library. Benin's father jokes that it took her seven years to read War and Peace, but she's got these books by Maupassant and Flaubert and Zola and Chekhov. And here's this 12 year old Benin, tremendously precocious, reading these books in saying, I didn't mind if I only understood half of what I read. I was happy with that half. So in the second half of the book, you meet a whole new set of characters. Now, at this point, she's only 14 years old and her cousin Gulnar, okay, is 16, all right? And nonetheless, Benin has all this baggage of, you know, French literature behind her. And in comes the Bolsheviks, right? And they seize her property and in Baku, and they seize her property in 
her, her property, her summer house, which is on the shores of the Caspian Sea. And they appropriated it and give it to different commissars and different officials in the Communist Party. And both Benin and her cousin Gulnar become kind of like servants or do the work of the party, spread the word. They've got these little Lenin pins on them and they go about like appropriating the houses of their neighbors. And Benin writes about this kind of self-disparagingly. She's so wise about herself and, I mean, recognizing her cowardice, but at the same time not judging herself. Gulnar falls into this, falls in love with this near 40-year-old communist official named Gregory. And, and then Benin, who is 14 years old, begins to fall in love with this guy named Andre, another communist party official. Both of them are war heroes. And at the same time, there's this guy named Jamil, who's 20 years older than her, who is working to get her father out of prison because the same regime, the Soviet regime that Benin is working for has got her father in prison. So she is basically committed to marrying this guy. She's repulsed by him. She talks about how she, she takes sadistic joy in hating him. Yet she's falling in love with this Russian official, plans to elope with him. I don't want to ruin it for you. But she says she's half Western, half Islamic. And that tension exists in every word and paragraph of the book. I mean, how often do you get the writer with great talent, great sensibility, an open mind, who has also lived in a tremendously rich historical period when there have been sweeping changes in society and these sweeping changes pass through her life and I have the joy and pleasure and honor of reviewing it I mean would I recommend this book in a just world in a just world this book would become an absolute classic in the feminist canon an absolute classic